Robert Powell is one of the world's leading authorities on the Stephenville UFO incident that took place in Texas in 2008. Robert was one of the first UAP investigators on the scene in the immediate aftermath, and he interviewed the key witnesses. Since then, he's written multiple papers about the UFO incident and was recently featured in an episode of the National Geographic series, UFOs, Investigating the Unknown. The episode Robert is featured in is about the Stephenville case and is called Giant UFO in Texas. This is my second interview with Robert. Please see the description for the link to the first. Robert, you've written multiple papers on the Stephenville UFO incident that took place in Texas in, I think, January 2008. Um, that case is actually how we initially got connected because of our mutual uh, friend, Rich Hoffman, um, who is your, we co-founded the SCU with you that, that we talked about in our first interview. Um, I want us to really dive deep into the Stephenville case during this uh, interview. So initially, if you could kind of talk about it in as much depth as you can, please imagine you're kind of explaining the case to somebody that's never heard of it, essentially. Um, so start from the beginning, as it were. Okay, so Stephenville uh, is, is Stephenville, Texas. It's in the northwestern part of the state of Texas. And this event happened in January 2008, mm -hmm. and it was my first foray into personal investigation of a major UFO incident. Right. And so the way this this all unfolded, and, and let me start maybe by giving you a little geographical feel for the area. Great. So you have the Dallas-Fort Worth area which is kind of in the northern central part of Texas. It's a major metropolitan area. And right next on the west side of the Dallas-Fort Worth area is a Air Force base that was originally called Carswell Air Force Base. Its name has changed since then. And if you go 70 miles to the southwest, you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there's a small Texas town named Stephenville, population about 25,000. Uh, it's a, a dairy farm center. And also near Stephenville, 10 miles further to the southwest, is a town called Dublin, Texas, which has maybe 2,000 people in it. Right. So you're really in a remote area of Texas. Yeah. It's, And then the, the southwest of there is a military operating area. So this is an area where the U.S. does practicing, uh, for example, their jet fighters will maybe do a bombing run, mm -hmm. drop flares, things, things of those those type. So that gives you kind of a feel for what's in this area. Yeah. Now, uh, on the night of, I believe it was January, it's either January 6th or January 8th of 2008. I think it was the 8th. I, I think that's why, I, yeah, when I was recapping yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, good, because I'm doing this off off from memory. Uh, <clears throat> I saw on my computer screen we were getting reports. I worked, I was part of MUFON at the time, mm -hmm. and within a 24 hour period of time, we had over 20 reports of UFO sightings in this one little geographical area around Stephenville and Dublin, Texas. Now that, for your listeners, is an enormous number of reports. So you know. I was excited. It was like, wow, okay, th this is a two hour, 15 minute drive for me. I'm, I'm headed to Dublin and Stephenville. Yeah. So, so just to jump in quickly, is that like you, sure. you got into work that you got into, did you, was it, were you working in an office or were you working from home? So it's like you check your uh, emails and then yeah, boom, no, you had C. I yeah, worked how from was home that? and I was, I was the director of research for right. a MUFON. So I'm monitor. Yeah. I'm, I was always monitoring, you know, the, the day, you know, what yeah. was going on on the screen and the data. Uh, so I see all these reports coming in from the same geographical area, right? Yeah. I mean, you always see reports, but all of a sudden they're clustered, you know, in this yeah. one location. So I said, there's something to this. Um, and so, you know, make some basic checks, phone calls, things like that to verify that there's some, re this is real. Mm -hmm. And so myself and a number, another, a number of other investigators, you know, meet in Dublin, Texas, and we right. begin to interview uh, probably a hundred different individuals, you know, who have seen these UFO sightings. Now, some of them saw what happened on January 8th, 
some came to tell us what happened one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, right? It was it was like the community had just opened the floodgates. Yeah, yeah, opened the floodgates, right? And it, and it was it was somewhat of a circus. I mean, I, I'm I've been there trying to interview a guy. And I'm like, I can't even hear myself think. There's so many people in this wow. building, right? Yeah. And so um, afterwards, I went and interviewed uh, the key witnesses personally at their homes at the location where they had the sighting, right? Mm-hmm. So those were the more valuables. But I, I just want to give everyone just kind of an image of how crazy it was. And there was national news media there and all of all of this kind wow. of thing. Yeah. So, uh, so one thing that I did immediately after getting there is I said, I need, I want the radar data for what was happening in the skies on this day. So yeah. I sent requests. There were five military bases with radar uh, within 50 miles of that location. So I sent requests to all those military bases. I sent requests to the FAA, you know, to get radar data. Okay. Mm-hmm. So meanwhile, so I've done that. And that's going to take weeks to, to happen, right? So now back to interviewing. So uh, I make several trips back and forth during the next you know few weeks. And I, and I interview all the witnesses, uh, all the key witnesses. So here's, here's how the entire event unfolded. At about 6.30 that evening, there's uh, a guy by the name of Steve Allen and three other witnesses who were out, you know, over a campfire having a, you know, a beer or two. They're not drunk or anything, but, you know, they're, they're enjoying their time. And, and then over, so over here, farther to the east is a truck driver headed west on a freeway. So this truck driver perhaps is the first guy that sees this object. And he sees what he declares or describes is a very bright light in front of him that's like a welder's light. And then he said, suddenly it just splits into two and the two lights, you know, move opposite of each other and disappear. At almost the same time, you have Steve Allen and these three people. They're about 20 miles from this guy. Mm -hmm. And what they see is these very bright lights moving rapidly uh, to the north of them and suddenly stopping and then the lights turn into a vertical position and then they suddenly just flash and disappear. All right. So you, so you have that happen and then everything's calm for about 30 minutes or so to right. 45 minutes. And then you start getting reports from all over the geographic area. And one of the key reports was the constable over the county who lived in that small town of Dublin, Texas. Mm-hmm. And so I went to, to his house and interviewed him. And th- th- his is my favorite of all the reports. He, he was very matter of fact, you know, like, as he said, he's not looking for UFOs. He, he actually said, well, I hope they're ours because yeah. if they're not, we're in trouble. You know, yeah. that was because he was concerned was what if those were Chinese or Russian. Right. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> here, here's what happens uh, to Constable uh, Leroy Gaten was his name. So he he's out at home. He's at his home and he goes outside and he looks to the south and he sees a couple of very bright lights just hovering right over the horizon. He tells me, I think they're about two miles away. And he said they were really interesting. I've never seen anything like this before. So Leroy goes back into his house to get his wife so he can have her come out and look at him. So he tells his wife, hey, there's some UFOs out here. You've got to come look at this. She's on the couch watching her favorite TV show. And she says, I'm not leaving my show to go look at Before being able to pause it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So forget it. (laughs) Yeah. And th- this is probably back in the day before you could have as much pausing of TV shows. Yeah. Right. So she's watching it live. And uh, so his nine year old son says, oh, I'll come with you, dad. So his nine year old comes out. They go back outside. He looks to the south and the lights are gone. 
But then he suddenly notices there are nine to 11 lights directly above him. And what he described was really kind of nonsensical. He said these nine to 11 lights were just randomly just moving around like dancing, Mm. you know, in, in the sky. And he said he went to get his binoculars to get a closer look of at them and his binoculars are in his uh, police car. So he just walks a few feet to get those and he grabs his binoculars, looks up. And as he's look, as he first looks up, he says, all the lights come together synch- synch- yeah, synchronistically. Right. Mm-hmm. So he's not saying they merge into one. He's just saying rather than randomly jumping around, they stop and then they move together to the Northeast and he describes it as like at the speed of light, but he was being facetious. You know, he just meant in extreme speed and he tells me they moved to the Northeast. Right. So now, you know, a week or two goes by, I get the radar data. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing I do with the radar data actually is to, look at all the F-16s that were traveling through so that I could know that the radar data was capable of tracking the F-16s before I go looking for UFOs, right? I'm doing this in a scientific manner. So once I verify that, I go to Leroy Gaten's location. So on radar, I know the time because I've interviewed Leroy. So Mm -hmm. on the radar data, I go to the time that Leroy said this occurred. I go to the latitude, longitude location on the radar, right? And so now I'm I'm basically looking with radar at what's happening at Leroy's house on that day at that time, right? And so south of his home, just like he described, there's an object on radar. And on the radar screen, it's like it's here. And every 10 seconds, the radar sweeps. Next 10 seconds, oh, it's moved over here. It's it's over here. It's not moving very far. It's just kind of mostly hovering and just kind of, you know, making some small movements. It's basically staying in that location, just like he described it. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you see this object. The next uh, turn of the ra- radar, it's to the northeast. It's traveled all the way to Stephenville. And one 10 second sweep of the radar. Wow. And I now that was my aha moment because yeah. Gayton, the, the constable, indicated it went at extreme speed to the northeast. And that's what happened on radar. And so I calculated the speed, and the speed was a minimum of 1900 miles per hour. That is like Mach 3. Mm-hmm. There are no jets that can go. F- Well, first, there are no jets that can hover above you like that and then suddenly take off at at Mach 3. Um, We don't have anything like that. So, you know, I verify that. I look, you know, for where Steve Allen was. I find two data points indicating an object moving to his north, east to west, as he described. And then I I just I, I look for a couple of other witness statements. And I find another object, which verif- which backs up some other witness statements. But this object is really strange. I have 185 radar returns. And this object, remember the geography of where Dallas-Fort Worth is and Stephenville's down here to the southwest? Well, if you go southeast of Stephenville, you go to a place called uh, the Bush Ranch. That was when George Bush was president. And when he was not at the White House, he stayed at his ranch. Now, he was not at the ranch that day. But this object is, I mean, it's crazy. It's its just traveling straight towards the George Bush ranch, right, on radar. Yeah. The F-16s, you know, I, I know where they're at on radar. They're not reacting to that at all. They're just off the military operating area doing their thing, right? But they're not. They're not intercepting this object. And and when I say I have this object, for your listeners, this object doesn't have a transponder. Any aircraft 
will have a transponder which says I'm aircraft such and such. I'm at this altitude. You know, I'm, you know, Southwest Airlines or what, what have you. All yeah. of these objects that were unknowns that I've been talking about, they are simple radar returns. In other words, the radar beam hits it, bounces off the skin, and goes back. Right? It's not a transponder radio signal going from the craft to the radar system. So here you have 185 returns of an object traveling an average speed of 47 miles an hour directly towards the Bush Ranch, which that is restricted airspace. No one is allowed to fly within three miles of that airspace. So for this to be happening and for the F-16s to just be ignoring it, I, I just I have no explanation for what was going on there. Yeah. Um, it's very but, strange. Yeah. So that's and how that's close kind did of, it get uh, to the Bush Ranch? This uh, well, here, here's the crazy thing, Ben. <laughs> I jumped ahead. For, <laughs> I asked for four hours of radar data. Right. Yeah. My radar data ended when the object was about five miles from the Bush Ranch, right, but I'm okay. sure it went over it. There's no doubt because I mean it had been traveling for 45 minutes already yeah. at, yeah. at this constant, you know, speed. Now, the other thing that was interesting is um, I found a, a pair of witnesses, and this was a husband and wife who every evening at around 8 o'clock, 8.30, they ride their bike, mm -hmm. and they lived two miles from the Bush Ranch. So they knew exactly where it was, and they told me they'd seen helicopters come and go from the Bush Ranch all the time, right, which would be helicopters taking the president back and forth that night they were riding their bikes and they see a very bright light. They described it as roughly four to five times brighter than Jupiter in the sky. So an extremely bright light drop down vertically towards the Bush ranch and then suddenly just zip off and disappear. So in the time at which they saw this, you know, they're, they're riding their bike. They know they always start at a certain time. So we're within five to 10 minutes, right, of when the radar, you know, shows this object moving to Bush's ranch. So we also have a visual confirmation of the object. Uh, so what's great about the Stevieville case, you have radar and a visual confirmation near the Bush ranch. You have radar and visual confirmation with, uh, you know, the the constable and then you have radar and visual confirmation with steve allen so you have yeah. like three times where a witness says they see something at a certain time a certain direction and then you verify that on radar that there's an object at that time in that in that direction so that's that's what makes it such a great uh case yeah. and and oh by the way the object that constable gaten saw that moved at 1900 miles an hour, the G forces that that object would have generated would have been nine G forces. Our fastest aircraft, which is the SR 71, in linear G forces, so just straight line G forces, can't exceed more than about two G forces. So when you hear that, you know, a pilot has a suit to withstand six to eight G forces, that's, that's because it's it's G forces generated by what we call tangential turning. So it's curvature, mm -hmm. right? It's like this sudden turn. It's not yeah. because he can generate seven G forces, you know, in a straight line by accelerating his jet. He can't get anywhere close to that. Yeah. Yeah. You need to, I, I don't know how fast you'd need to go to generate that kind of G force, but yeah. I, mean, I guess 1900 miles an hour approximately. <laughs> well, it, yeah. it, it's Just how, a, how, how quickly you get to that speed and yeah, to get yeah, to course, 1900 yeah, yeah. in what space of yeah, in what distance in 10 yeah. seconds a minimum of 10 seconds could have been shorter i mean a maximum yeah. of 10 seconds um wow. now there's another story that goes with the stephenville case that happened right before mm -hmm. the whole stephenville incident and, and, and this is interesting there okay so this is two weeks before stephenville happened and this is in a a uh, small, it's actually in a guy's 
a small home and ranch uh, that's just outside of the Dublin area. So the guy's name is Stevie, uh, excuse me, Ricky Sorrells. And it's two weeks earlier, he's out deer hunting. So he's out deer hunting and suddenly the sky gets dark. And so he looks up to see why is, why is it getting dark? And there's this giant craft that's hovering above him. Is this daytime so, that he's doing this? Or daytime, is it daytime, daytime, middle of daytime. the day. Yeah. Right. right. And so all of a sudden, you know, it got dark. Like he's thinking, okay, this is another Texas thunderstorm that must be forming. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's this giant craft over him. And so he looks up at the object and, you know, it is so, because it's so close to him and so large, he can't tell the shape. Right. He doesn't know if this is a triangle, a disc, what the shape is, because it's too close and too large. So only a few seconds goes by when the, the craft takes off. And this craft, as he described it, just zipped off in a matter of seconds and was gone. And what amazed Ricky Sorrels and what stuck in his head was, how did that happen without there being just a gust of wind that sucked him along with the craft, right? Because right. you can't, an object that size can't move through the air without causing a suction of air as it you know, takes off. And yet he felt nothing. It's, it was able to move without him feeling a thing in terms wow. of air movement. Yeah. So, so Ricky, the next day he goes and he, he uh, let me describe Ricky. Ricky is, I met a, met him in person several times he's probably six two or six three weighs 260 pounds and he's not fat he's a big right. guy he's got his big texas 10 gallon hat and he's a good old country boy you know he's 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 pretty straightforward simple you know he's you know that a man of few words and so <clears throat> you know i when i he goes to work the next day he tells his the guys at work. Of course, they all make fun of him. They're all laughing at him, joking. Oh, yeah, you saw a giant UFO on top of your head, Ricky. And so he he doesn't talk about it again, other than the guys at work. Two weeks goes by. It's January, the day after January eighth. It's January night, and his uh, comrades at work come in and hey, Ricky, you were telling us the truth. They have the front page of the Stephenville paper, right? That talks about all the UFO reports that happened that day. So that's um, an interesting case that that's related to the Stephenville case, but did not happen on the exact day. Yeah. Wow. Were there any other like um, incidents or witness uh, reports of anything in between that and the January the 8th? Um, I think there might be one. There may have been one other one, but nothing, you know, spectacular. It was, you know, I mm -hmm. saw some lights in the sky kind of report. Yeah. Yeah. And of all the reports that you had on, on the eighth, did anybody see anything as close or remotely as close as, as Ricky? Only one, and that was a a policeman in Stephenville. This happened at about the time, you know, where Constable Gaten says the UFO leaves and heads towards Stephenville. Mm -hmm. About that same time, there's a policeman in Stephenville, and he sees this huge object, and he described it as more than a city block across, and he says it's so large, he can't say what its shape is, wow. because yeah. he's just seeing the edge of it as it you know, goes across the horizon. So yeah. he turns his radar gun on the object, because he's <laughs> sitting parked, and uh, he said the object and this is what's weird. The object, you know, like if this is the object, all he sees is the, the line of the object mm -hmm. in the sky. It turns vertical, and it doesn't pivot on the center like that, the way you would think. It just goes like this. It just turns like that. Wow. And then and then it starts to move away from him. And he clocked it at 29 miles an hour uh, on his radar gun. Wow. And, it, you know, then the object, you know, disappears off in the uh to the horizon uh mm -hmm. as it you know begins to speed up but um that's the only other uh report and 
there were two other policemen with him, so they submitted a drawing that they made of the, you know, of the object. Um, Did you? Do you have a copy of the drawing? Yeah. Yes, I've got a, a copy of it. It's uh, it's basically uh, like I say, you can't tell the shape. You just see, you know, the front line of it in their uh, tower rods that are coming out of the front, kind of like giant antennas. Mm-hmm. So then when it turns sideways, the antennas are just sticking out you know on the on the side yeah wow um and yeah so either of the the witnesses that saw it close up today were they able to describe much more than you know like you said one of them couldn't describe the shape at all one of them drew what they they could did they say anything about like kind of the uh the, the skin of the craft like what and did could they give any detail like that ricky did because he was the closest and so to him uh you know he does welding work and uh mm-hmm that type of work. What he found interesting was he could see no seams. There were no seams on the craft, you know, by a seam, I'm talking about where you see a bolt and a connection. Like if you look out at an airplane wing, you see the bolts and all this, everything was just perfectly smooth. There was not any indication of how the surface was put together. You know, it was a, a constant smooth surface. Yeah. And do you think it, over kind of looking at all of these various reports, do you think it was all one one various object that's moving or one object, sorry, that's moving around or were there multiple objects potentially? Yeah, you know, based on the radar data, it had to be multiple objects right. okay. because the three, object that, yeah, the object moving towards the Bush ranch was yeah, different. Course, yeah, that's different. Yeah, yeah. Than the other objects. Uh, that Did you have seen. any idea so of the size of the thing going towards the Bush ranch? No, uh, the radar, a uh, civilian yeah. radar data won't give you the size of an object. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did estimate um, size based on some witnesses who would see the light and could describe the light in terms of how much uh, angular space it took up in the sky. Mm-hmm. So doing some math based on that, I came up with probably around a quarter of a mile, which would be about 1,250 feet yeah, um, in size. Big, big as well. Maybe not yeah, as big so as large, the other one, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was definitely large, whatever, yeah, whatever yeah, it was. Wow. And the big one, it was the main object was potentially up to like a mile long, right? That's, uh, well, you know, it's hard to say. That's why I was saying yeah. I estimated it yeah. at quarter, a quarter of a mile, which is like 1,200 and... Let's see, 20, <clears throat> 20, about 1,400 feet would be a quarter mile. Okay, I thought that was the one heading towards the Bush Ranch. I was thinking of the one that was seen by Ricky and the policeman and stuff. Oh, yeah, the one that I estimated would be more the one that was seen by the constable, and okay, Steve got Allen, got and, and potentially the policeman. Yeah. Uh, the one going to, going to the Bush Ranch, I don't have any information to yeah. estimate its size. Okay, I got you. Okay, we're on the same page. Um, in terms of the reports, like, uh, you, did you say there were twenty reports? It, was it in the space of four hours? Um, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and the distance from Dublin to Stephenville, they were all within that. And and how many miles was that again? Well, that's within ten miles. But some of the reports were individuals where the object was not near them, but they could see the object from their locations. Yeah. So. If you use Stephenville and Dublin as the hub, there were reports that came in as far as 40 miles to the north and, you know, probably 20 to 30 miles to the east and another, yeah. you know, 20 miles to the southwest. So it, it was a okay. fairly good sized geographic area yeah, where the reports came in from. And that was reflected in the reports, like in terms of like it being further away or seeming smaller. and that Right, kind of thing. right. The light was not as bright, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Okay, okay. And all the reports were really similar. I mean, obviously, you've talked about a couple of them in detail. The rest kind of followed the same pattern. Were there anything else that stood out? Was there anything that was really different or? Yeah. Mm, yeah, not, not really. Most of the other reports were of, of lights. At a, at a distance as compared mm-hmm. to the guys, you know, that I mentioned. Um, there was one lady who was in the, she was just south of Stephenville and she was driving her car home. 
So she was moving away from Stephenville and she saw the lights and they were so, she described them as if there was a uh, school bus, you know, mm-hmm. you, the two big red lights that are on the back of a school bus that it was as if they were that size and they were coming out of the sky towards her. So she thought wow. it was an aircraft that was about to crash. She actually pulled her car off to the side of the road because she thought she was going to be hit by an aircraft. Oh, wow. So it was, it was pretty, pretty close, you know, you know, for yeah. her. And, yeah, for sure. And frightening by the sounds of it. Yeah. Um, that's another question, I guess, with the, the kind of general tone of the reports, um, of, or at least of the people you spoke to, like, were they kind of afraid, like the people that saw it in the night, the people that you've interviewed since, were they afraid? Were they in awe? Were they, you know, shocked, surprised? What were their emotions? Like, what were they feeling? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. So F-16s fly over this town all the time because they okay. fly from Dallas, Fort Worth to that military operating area. So they're familiar with F-16s. They see them at night all the time um the objects that they saw what most people would say to me is they would just say we would just like to know what it was you know what was it we saw so they weren't actually jumping to the conclusion of these are extraterrestrial or these are aliens they were just like i'd like to know what they were yeah you know, you know can you guys tell us what what these were right and that that was their um view of so they're they're basically people who you know grew up in the country in a small town and are familiar with the night sky they're familiar with f-16s and helicopters that go by all the time and so they they wanted to know what it was so when the air force um the reporter in the area angela joiner uh when she contacted the air force at carswell air force base and the their public relations officer said, "No, we didn't. You know, we didn't have any jets in the sky that night. We don't. You know, who knows? They probably saw a commercial jet at high altitude reflecting mm-hmm. the sunshine. Right? That that really insulted the the township, right? Because it's like, no, we know what you know, commercial jets and military jets, you know, look like." And yeah. and we know there were F-16s out that night because there were there were a total of 10 F-16s that night that were flying. And so the the township was very uh, upset that the Air Force, you know, initially said they had no jets. Now, two weeks later, the Air Force came back and said, oh, uh, yes, we were wrong. We did have some jets in yeah. up in the sky. And I had the ra- and not long afterwards, I got the radar data. So. It was easy to tell that, yes, there were jets in, in the sky. And I, I got the logs. I was able to get Cartsville Air Force Base to send me the logs of the 10 jets that flew wow. that night. Mm-hmm. And and since then, I found out the the UAP task force, right, they actually read this, my Stephenville report. And so Jay Stratton told me, he said uh, that he – went to interview some of those F-16 pilots because, mm-hmm. you know, he wanted to get their statements on what happened that night. And none of them, even though Jay had a top secret clearance, none of them would, would talk to him. Really? Because they just said, you know, you don't have a need to know. Just And, and that, that's true in, in the military, right? Just because you have a top secret clearance uh, yeah. doesn't mean you can see everything that's top secret. Yeah. You, yeah. you have to have a need to know and it uh now i would think that they would think the guy who heads up the uap task force should have a need to know mm-hmm. but uh yeah they wouldn't talk to him yeah interesting um and so there were 10 f-16s in the area how many of them were kind of seen or observed following the the object or objects oh okay so so first just a general view there's four f-16s that take off earlier in the evening uh-huh. Another four that come about maybe 30 to 45 minutes later. And then there's two F-16s that are far north into Oklahoma. That's the state north of Texas. Right. And <clears throat> these F-16s have been on a, a different area doing something totally different. And they fly due south towards Stephenville and Dublin, right? Mm-hmm. And the route they take is not 
a standard route. Like when the military jets operate in civilian airspace, they normally fly certain routes. Like, right, they fly over Stephenville and Dublin on the way. They Hence don't... why all the people of Stephenville recognize the, yeah, the right. aircraft. But these two jets came from Oklahoma traveling due south towards Stephenville and Dublin. That was not a typical route. So right. it's like, so, and this was later in the night at, at around eight o'clock. It's like someone said, fly you know, down to Stephenville and Dublin and check out what's going on. And then after they did that, then they flew back to Cardswell Air Force Base. So it was like they go up, do their thing, come straight back down, then go over. And so that um, that kind of gives you a, a feel for what was happening with F-16s. Now, the one person who says that they saw the jets following the UFO chasing it, mm-hmm. that really got blown up in the media. I mean, that became the thing, right? The jets yeah. were chasing the UFO. But Steve Allen is actually the only person that I'm aware of who visually saw the jets two jets chasing UFO. Mm -hmm. When I looked at the radar data, I can't find those two jets chasing the UFO. And I even looked for these two mystery jets, you know, did the two jets, did they stay low, you know, out of radar range? Because if a jet's low enough, he he doesn't show up on radar. So did they just stay low all the way until they got back to Carswell air force base? Well, I looked, for all the jets landing in Carswell Air Force Base, and I could not find these two mystery jets. So if they existed, right, there's two possibilities. Either that didn't happen, right, Mm -hmm. or if it did happen, they came out of a different different base. And the nearest Mm -hmm. base is in New Mexico, where they have F-22s rather than F-16s. And... So those could have been F-22s, and if they were, an F-22 is somewhat of a stealth aircraft, then I probably would not have been able to detect them with FAA radar. Right. Now, the other piece of evidence supporting uh, you know, Steve Allen's story is I talked to the guy who ran uh, the small civilian airport in a small town there. I'm talking about like Piper Cubs and Cessna aircraft that come and go out of the airport. Well, the guy who managed the aircraft, he also, you know, is familiar with the F-16s and also the sound, right? Because they're normally at 10,000 feet as they go by. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, that night he heard jets at very low altitude, right? So he said, these things were so low, they shook my building. So he's saying that, but he did not visually see the jets. He just heard them and felt them. So that would support Steve's story that you had jets at very low altitude uh, that went through that area that night. Yeah. It's just I can't corroborate it with radar data. Interesting. But you can corroborate that there were jets in the area and they seemingly were scrambled via a different route to normal. And they were right. very much in the vicinity of where these UFOs were. Right, right. And those jets on radar never engaged the UFO. They never moved mm-hmm. towards the UFOs uh, on the, you know, based on radar. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um Overall, like including the witnesses that reported on the day and including people that you've spoken to since, how many witnesses do, to the event are you aware of at this point? Like, uh, again, I'm if it's an approximate of, number, I don't know if you have like an yeah, exact number. No, but. I don't have any exact, probably about 30 that I'm aware of. And normally, mm-hmm. and this is a pretty good rule of thumb for every individual who reports a UFO, there's 10 that don't. Yeah. So if there were 30 that reported it, there were a much larger number of people that saw it. Yeah. And I would say that's, that's quite generous. I'd say you could, they could easily be more than 10, right. For every one that reports like uh, it's the same as leaving reviews and stuff. If you're looking at a restaurant, there's all these three bad reviews for for those three bad reviews. There were probably 50 people that had a really nice, (laughs) yeah, exactly. um, That had a really nice meal. Um, have there been any decent attempts to debunk this case? Like uh, any pop, uh, there's probably been attempts, of course. Uh, are there any popular ones that have, yeah, you felt 
decent. The attempt. only one I, like, I uh, saw was uh, a guy. Let's see, I can't even remember his name now. I haven't he's kind of disappeared from the debunker field, but it, his debunking was well that uh, Powell just took random points on the radar data and just linked them up to try to create, uh, you know, an image on radar of, of the UFOs. Right. So basically his, his debunking was saying that, that I cherry pick data points, which you can't cherry pick data points on a rate on radar data. I mean, the data is what the data is, right? Either yeah. the data was there or I lied and made up, made it up, right? But the Stephenville data, that raw radar data is available. Yeah. Um, on Z- I've uh, actually posted it all on a site called Zenodo. Okay. And so not only is the report there, but the radar, the raw radar data uh, from the FAA. And it, it was like 250 megabytes of data mm-hmm. uh, because it came from five radar sites uh, that covered all of all of Texas. Oh, and by the way, Ben, I, I forgot to mention those five military bases that have radar, uh, none of them would provide uh, their radar data. I, I got yeah. the same response back from every military base, and the response was, uh, we have no information uh, that corroborates your request. I don't know exactly what that means, right? I know we won't <laughs> prove it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, it sounds like legalese that an attorney told them to say. But yeah. they all those bases had radar, and none of them would, you know. But historically, I have never gotten radar data from a military installation. The, mm-hmm. You know, and the reason they will give is always national security, but the military won't give you their radar data. But I, I yeah. gave it a shot anyway, just in case. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad. And obviously, it wouldn't really be national security implications now at this point, 16 years later, but I'm sure they still wouldn't give it up. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, they would not. <laughs> no. After all of that stuff died down, like a year or so after, is it right that a bunch of people like uh, saw the same kind of thing again, like a big craft with lights and all that kind of thing i the, the the lady or a lady that worked for the local paper i think said that they had like a dozen calls or something like that is that accurate yeah they, that, are you uh, aware of that yeah yes and i if i remember right either in july or october of that year later on there was another uh there was a rash of sightings but i'm i'm not positive but i'm fairly confident that that group of sightings was due to the military dropping flares, right? You know, okay. military flares. Yeah. Um, what what often happens in a, a UFO case is <clears throat> people, right? The media exposes it. People get alerted to it, and then everyone starts looking, you know, for a UFO. And then people, almost anything they see, can become a, you know, a, a UFO. And and mm-hmm. actually, to be fair, a military flare is something that would be very easy to to mistake as UFO because I had a video sent to me uh, from that time period of the second set of reports where someone videoed it. And it's it's clear to me from the video that what she videoed were military flares. But mm-hmm. when you look at it, what you see is it looks like you've got uh, lights that are rotating around like a giant disc because you see a light turn on another light and another light and another one and another one. And then this one disappears and this one disappears, you know, as if it's rotating, but what's happening is, is the F 16 is flying at a distance. He's dropping flares. And so each, each flare lasts about 10 seconds. And then, the, mm-hmm. then he drops the next one, then the next one, the next one. So you see a sequence of lights turning on. So it's easy to mistake uh, yeah. it as a UFO. Yeah. And obviously you had the, yeah, the the military training area nearby. So at this point, 16 and a half years after the incident, and you've done loads of research, what do you think the UFO or UAP or UFOs at Stephenville actually are or were? What, what do you think? What do you think was behind 
that mystery and i'm guessing it's not flares even though even right, though it's right. close no, to that military it's not, uh, in our first interview as well you talked about the et hypothesis do you think that is what fits this case like yeah again what, what do you think yeah. the, the ufo I, I think the et hypothesis you know could fit this case very well um and whatever it was i think was intelligently controlled right because anything that can accelerate uh mm. any large object that can can do extreme acceleration there has to be intelligent control because you can't suddenly accelerate can stop as well yeah right yeah <laughs> there, there, there's some intelligence behind it by definition yeah. so um yeah I, I think the et hypothesis is probably the best explanation for what happened in stephenville and yeah and just to back up ben for someone who's just hearing this and nothing else even with the radar data and all that I had, if this was the only case that, you oh, know, yeah. had been, I would go, well, yeah. you know, I just chalk it off to weird. Don't know. Can't explain it. It's just weird. Right. But when you just have case after case like this, right. Yeah. For the last 80 years, you can't chalk it off anymore. You have yeah. to say there's something behind this. And mm -hmm. for me, it's the you know extraterrestrial hypothesis being the most likely explanation. Yeah, and if people want to hear more about your thoughts on that, yeah, they can listen to our first interview. But as you say, it's not just a standalone; it's one piece essentially of a thousand-piece jigsaw or a ten-thousand-piece yeah. jigsaw or what have you that's been gradually being put together over the last yeah eighty years or, or longer. Um, I know we're kind of basically reaching the end of our time together today, Robert. Are, are there any last words that you have on this case or on anything relevant to this before we wrap it up or anything we've missed or anything like that? Anything you want to highlight um, at all? No, I, I think we've covered it really well and uh, I pre appreciate it. And I, I would just say for me, the Stephenville case is, is probably one of the top 10 or 20 cases in history on the mm. UFO uh, incidents you know that we've yeah. documented and that's mostly because i was able to get the radar data if i had not mm. been able to get the radar data it would not be near as uh, a stalwart of a case yeah absolutely and and your colleague rich hoffman actually put it in his top five that's where it came up when i was talking with him we did like a top five ufo cases kind of episode and oh he, okay he, yeah included this in his top well, five and that's where i kind of became more interested and i was like oh yeah can you put me in touch with your colleague who yeah knows more about it, it very well could be in the top five because of the radar data but yeah there, it's like i said there's so many good cases like this that you, yeah. you just can't can people you can't continue to ignore it as if it didn't happen yeah, absolutely. Maybe next time we talk, I'll get you to, to give me your top five. Even if we don't go into them in detail, I'll get you oh, to do I'd a bit of thinking that, sure. and, and, and tell me what they are. Um, uh, so also, you mentioned a website uh, where you put the radar data and things like that. Um, could you repeat the name of it? And maybe you send me the link as it, well so I can include that in the description. Yes, I should probably send you the link. The, the site is called Zenodo, Z-E-N-O-D-O. -E okay. But okay. I'll, I'll send you the link uh, to great. the site so that you can put it in perfect well look, thank you again so much for this robert i really appreciate it i appreciate your time and and sharing what you your knowledge and experiences in, in relation to this case is fascinating and and obviously we have you to thank in in no small part uh for getting this case you know into the awareness of people and and especially with you know the, the radar data and everything like that and, and lots of the interviews um so thank you uh for, for for your part in that and for for sharing it with me today i wish you all my best and and i look forward to hopefully talking again in the future well thanks ben yes i look forward to it also thank you to robert powell for talking with me thank you to our patrons for their invaluable support and thank you for listening please check out robert's books via links in the description please subscribe to continue unraveling the universe with us and if you want to help us keep making content please consider a monthly contribution via patreon thank you